Good afternoon and welcome back to the annual symposium of the Bristol and Gloucestershire, Bristol and Gloucestershire Society Committee for Archaeology with our theme this year being a day of Gloucester archaeology. Now before we go to our next speaker there are some housekeeping rules I need to read out to you. First off my name is Andrew Armstrong, I'm the City Archaeologist at Gloucester City Council. Um, we are, to start with, we're very grateful to Cotswold Archaeology for all their support and assistance with hosting this Zoom conference. Um, any new attendees who are just joining the um, symposium now, please do type in the chat box where you're joining us from. It's always very interesting to see where people are listening and watching from. Um, please note that the, that the raised hand option at the bottom of the screen is not available at the moment. It's been disabled. Now, during the course of the various speakers speaking, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom there on the left. And what will happen is we will have a panel discussion at the end of all the talks where we will put your questions to the speakers. We are recording this, these lectures, so um, these will be available to view on the Cotswold Archaeology YouTube website approximately two weeks after we've finished. And there will be a short survey when you leave the webinar, uh, which we would ask if you could fill in, because um, it really helps us in going forward and preparing um, new uh, seminars and conferences. So moving on then, our first speaker today is something of a hero of Gloucester's archaeology. Our speaker is Henry Hurst. Um, Henry Hurst was effectively the city archaeologist in the mid to late 1960s, and he um, undertook rather heroically to try and excavate some very important sites in the city that were at risk of being destroyed. He, um, he left Gloucester and went on to, to, I suppose, greater things. He worked in Rome. You may have heard of Rome. He worked in Carthage. You may have heard of Carthage. And he, um, but to his great credit, he's never forgotten Gloucester and he's still writing about his work in the city even today. And very recently he published a brilliant book about the Roman Forum in Gloucester, which I do recommend to you. Henry's going to speak today about some excavations at 10 Eastgate Street. Um, we have slightly got the title of his talk wrong in our, in our leaflet, for which I do apologise to Henry. Um, his talk's title is actually The Barracks of the First Cohort and the Transition from Fortress to Colonia. So take it away, please, Henry. Thank you so much, Andy. Yes, I want to talk about um, two aspects of two aspects of Roman Gloucester that arise from this dig at the old um, market uh, building at 10 Eastgate Street. And we begin with a, a small moment of nostalgia that most of us are far too young for. This is pre-1956 Eastgate Street looking towards the cross. And we can date it because the body of St. Michael's Church is still there. It was demolished in 1956. And also the 1856 market entrance is where the Victorians put it. As now re-erected, it is roughly where Curry's is in the photograph. That old south side of Eastgate Street was blitzed under the Eastgate development, which gave us the present shopping precinct. The two topics I want to talk about have arisen from doing the detailed write-up after a short pause of 53 years of a site we excavated in summer 1969 um, at, that East, at the old market, market site where Marks and Spencer is now. This was dug out to become a basement at that time for Woolworths. The basement is arrowed um, here and you can see its outline extending from Eastgate Street in the north down to Bell Lane, now Bell Walk uh, in the south. This 10 Eastgate Street site is sometimes seen by archeologists as an example of the bad old archeology span days before planning policy guideline 16, though I don't think that's a very useful way of looking at it. Archeology span was in fact made a condition of the planning consent here but in a 1960s manner. Six weeks were allowed for excavation and the developers made sure they dug out the first half as soon as the three weeks uh, were up, sorry, excavation in two halves of three weeks. 
and the developers um, made sure they dug out the, the, the first half as, uh, as soon as that first three weeks were up. So on the right, uh, and you're looking towards Eastgate Street in the background there, there are some of the team of mainly student volunteers without a hard hat in sight, um, while the contractor's bulldozer in the distance excavates way down in what had been the first part of the dig. That first part of the dig is shown on the left in a view from Eastgate Street. Um, this was a time before open area excavation was the norm. So the main grid is of the unexcavated bulks between trenches. At this point, a moment of tribute to John Rhodes, who was a vital support uh, in organizing many aspects of the excavation, to Jonathan Erskine, who did the site plans, and to the three supervisors, Norman Taylor, who I hope has joined us from his home in Bromley, and Patrick Garrett and Brian Clawson, who sadly are no longer with us. Patrick was a great figure in Gloucester's archaeology, as I'm sure many will know. Brian was a distinguished barrister from the Chancery Law Court who took early retirement to devote himself to archaeology, and he added luster to the dig. I should add, that the main discoveries from this site have been known about that have been, have been known the last 50 years from two interim reports published in the Antiquaries Journal, and there is a piece in one of the early issues of Glevensis. We found parts of three barrack blocks on this site, and the first topic is to try and understand better the layout of the first cohort in the legionary fortress. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Roman barracks. But here's a reminder, based on the evidence from this site, buildings split length, lengthwise into three portions, uh, a front veranda, um, which faced a gravel space between separate barrack blocks, a series of small rooms for equipment, and uh, at the back, the sleeping quarters or contubernia. Contubernium means a tent sharing group of eight men, here translated into a fixed building. They shared a space about four by four meters. Bunk beds are, however, I'm sure more to do with modern children than the Roman army, but this at least reminds us uh, where, the Roman, where, the, where the soldiers slept. Here on the left, you can see a trench um, running across the uh, slide um, with three rectangular pits, in front of it. Um, this belongs to the third of three barrack buildings revealed in the dig. So here on the right, up at the top is Eastgate Street. Here is Barracks One. That's a stores building in front of it, nearer to Eastgate Street. This is a gravel space between barrack blocks. Here's Barracks Two. Here's Barracks Three. Here are the three posts that you can see in that slide. And I also want to talk a little bit about this big pit, pit 91, which you can see here. It's got a bulk of the excavation running across it, but there it is, full of murky green water. Um, it's a large pit, about one and a half by four metres, placed in the space, as you see, between barrack number three and a fourth one, which we didn't excavate to the south. A 2004 study described similar pits associated with barracks on Hadrian's Wall and suggests that such pits, such large pits outside barrack blocks, may have been for refuse from pack animals supporting the unit. So it just gives an extra dimension to the bare bones of the, the barracks. In a Roman fortress, the first cohort was usually housed to the right of the Principia or headquarters building. Um, and here's the Gloucester plan on the left. A typical cohort would be composed of slightly under 500 men divided into six centuries of 80 men each with probably a small mounted attachment. So a barrack block for a century of men, which would mean 80, um, would theoretically have 10 of these contubernia or sleeping spaces. They're very small on the plan here, these little uh, grids here. Um, the most frequently there were about 12 contubernia allowing for some supporting soldiers. And in a typical cohort, there would be six barrack blocks. The first cohort, 
um, was usually larger, around a thousand men instead of 500. Inchtothill, the fortress built in Perthshire a decade after Gloucester, illustrates this with barracks for 10 centuries of men, or more exactly 11 and a half, and five centurions' houses. And we can see Inchtothill on the right here. So here are the barrack blocks, 10 of, 10 of them, and there's sort of one and a half here. And here are the centurions' houses, one, two, three, four, five. Looking at the comparable area in Gloucester, so we're looking at the area to the right of the Principia, the barracks are laid out at right angles to the rampart, um, per scamnum, if you want the Latin, as opposed to the more common parallel to the rampart, as at Inch Tuthil, per strigas, if you want the Latin. And you can see that in this first cohort, there aren't a Gloucester, there aren't 10 block, uh, barrack blocks, but, ten, but, but six. One, two, three, four, five, six. However, if you put together the information from the Woolworths basement, 10 Eastgate Street, where we had the west end of the blocks and the New Market Hall, where uh, excavation directed by Mark Hassel in 1966, the barrack blocks come out as exceptionally long, with 18 or 19 contubernia instead of the usual 12 or so. This plan on the left is, of course, partly reconstructed, so it can be uh, challenged. But I think it's believable that these were exceptionally long barracks, whatever the exact number of contubernia. Uh, so these six very long barrack buildings deliver the one hard fact that we have to work with, and that is that Gloucester had a first cohort that was larger than the usual six centuries of men. First cohorts with 10 centuries of men can be seen or plausibly supposed at several fortresses as Carleon, Chester, Inchtothil, Neuss in Germany and Nijmegen. And this study by Bartz in 2000 gives an example of some of these um, first cohorts. They also usually show larger um, provision for the centurions um, and, and that they took the form typically of courtyard houses, and you can see here in the larger plan of the detail of Inch, Inch Tuthil, um, a nice courtyard house there for the princeps, and an even bigger one here for the primus pilus. And the primus pilus was the most senior of theoretically 59 centurions in a legion of 5,200 men, and in effect the top professional soldier, since the tribunes and the legate above him were mainly politicos, so the primus pilus was not a guy to trifle with. The centurion's quarters for other cohorts were more modest corridor houses, of which we'll see two examples from the telephone exchange at Barclay Street in a moment. In our previous reconstruction of the first cohort, we had assumed six outline centurion houses of the small corridor type. I don't think that would have gone down well with the primus pilus. And one other thing to note before leaving this uh, image is the plan of the first, first cohort at Nijmegen, which is in Holland, on the Lower Rhine, dating to about 100 AD. The barracks are laid out per scamnum at right angles to the um, defences, uh, as at Gloucester. And you can see on the left a detached group of one courtyard house um, and two barrack blocks. Um, with six barrack blocks and four more houses in the main group to the right. We could do something like that at Gloucester if we put the primus pilus and possibly two centuries in the narrow insula between the Principia and the six blocks further east. So here's the Principia, um, here's the six blocks. This is this narrow insula which has no other function. And so you can put the primus pilus here and then make for reasonably sized centurion's houses, as at Nijmegen, at the end of these very long blocks, um, the, the other long blocks. I don't set a huge amount of store by this because obviously it's a guess. I mean, it gives Gloucester a plausible, normal sized first cohort, and it would be acceptable, I think, to the primus pilus. Sometimes people suggest that because Gloucester, the Gloucester Legionary Fortress was slightly small, it was not 
design for a legion at full strength. I don't think that's such a good example because Gloucester's fortress area was 80 and 85% of the area of Inch Tuthil and Caerleon, but it was actually 106% of the area of the legionary fortress at Lincoln. So it wasn't hugely out of line. And you could save space in many ways. If you suggest a diminished army unit, this is essentially an unprovable thing until you've excavated the entire fortress. I guess that's why I don't like it so much. Anyway, enough about the um, first cohort and the barracks. Topic number two, the transition to the Colonia is altogether a more central one, I would say, for Gloucester's archaeology. And first of all, on the Colonia of Gloucester, here are two key documents, historic documents, if you like. On the left is the tombstone in Rome of Marcus Alpius Quintus, who came from Gloucester, Glavi, at the end of the third line, um, gives his place of origin. Ner, at the end of the second line, gives us the Nervan element in Gloucester's title, Colonia Nervia. Here, part of the formal name of Roman Gloucester has been used instead of a voting tribe for Alpius, showing that Alpius was a Roman citizen with an entitlement to vote. Nerva was emperor between 96 and 98. So that theoretically is the date at which Gloucester became a colonia. There is, however, a twist on this, that Nerva's predecessor, Domitian, suffered damnatio memoriae, what has now happened to Mr. Colston in Bristol. So maybe Gloucester was founded as a colonia under Domitian and retitled Nervan when the memory of Domitian was being wiped away. I don't think we should get excited about this because the difference between whether Gloucester became a colonia in the late 80s or late 90s is too fine to pick up in regular archaeological dating, and it doesn't really affect the understanding of how the colonia emerged. The image on the right of the tombstone of Lucius Valerius Aurelius stands for the colonists of Gloucester, ex-legionaries and ex-auxiliary soldiers who were granted Roman citizenship on completing their term of service because as a colonia was a settlement of Roman citizens, they would have been the dominant element in the population. This tombstone can be dated to the mid to late second century by the, the name Aurelius and by the type of costume. As the caption on the top right implies, to understand the transition to colonia, we have to understand the fortress better. But just before we do that, here are the corridor type centurions houses at Barclay Street, which I was talking about earlier. They, oops. Let's get back. Um, there you are, just with a corridor and rooms leading off it. Now, the fortress problem. In the early Roman levels, there are consistent first period and second period remains as found at the New Market Hall, at the Woolworths basement, and here in Barclay Street, and also, I'd guess, in more recent excavations. When we were able to excavate them in detail over a good extent at Barclay Street, the second period on the bottom right had a very similar plan to the first one on the top left. Understanding what that means has been a challenge. In the two interim reports of 1972 and 1974, and in a volume called The Roman West Country, published in 1976, the first period was interpreted as fortress, and the second one as a fortress-like rebuild for the first inhabitants of the colonia. On reflection, I didn't think that made sense. So in a book called Fortress into City, edited by Graham Webster and published in 1988, I suggested there were two fortresses, the first built in the 60s, the second in the late 80s, dated by stratified coins. However, the idea of Gloucester being rebuilt as a legionary fortress in the late 80s did not go down well against the historical background that after Agricola's attempt to conquer Scotland ending, ending in 84, the British garrison was reduced to three legions and these had fortresses at Caerleon, Chester and York starting in the 70s. Mark Hassel and I had a debate published in the Coloniae volume in 1999, in which he said essentially that, and supported the earlier suggestion that the second period represented the first colonia. 
I stuck to the two fortresses idea. There is, I think, a solution, and it turns on how we understand the constructional details of the fortress, seen most clearly at Barclay Street. Um, first fortress at top, second fortress below. Top left are two partition clay walls supported by upright posts um, at, at floor level. There's the floor, there's the clay wall. Um, and top right shows these remains, not exactly those, but similar ones, when the clay wall and the floor has been stripped away. So this is the original ground surface of Gloucester and the orange stripe is a trench dug and filled with the slightly yellower sand into which posts are put and the posts have conveniently rotted as voids showing their line. So this is a post in trench um, construction which supports a clay wall. Bottom left and right, you have a different type of construction this is based on timber sills laid on the ground. And obligingly here, there's a tiny bit of one that's been burnt, otherwise making a very shallow feature in the ground and a bit more of it over here. There's a bit of charred timber. Over here on the right, you can see another bit of charred sill and you can see a little bit of the wall plaster on the right-hand side of it. And there's another sill there. So period one, period two, in terms of what you see archeologically and also, this was true of the back walls of barrack blocks. The back walls um, weren't post in trenches. They were lias stones, lias mudstone in clay. And this is an example from 10 Eastgate Street. Whereas in the second period, there's mortar and it's mortar and stone and oolitic limestone, as well as the lias mudstone. And on the right hand side here, you can see a bit of the 10 Eastgate Eastgate Street excavation with the wall trenches dug out, the wall trenches that had the posts in them, and you can see one going down here and it runs under one of these masonry walls like the one there on, on the left. So the replacement of post in trench walls by sills and also masonry walls is present at other timber fortresses. Um, for a start at King's Home, there are two builds, probably with timber build, sills the second time. And both constructions are present at Exeter and Colchester, just to take three examples that come to mind. So instead of Fortress 1 and Fortress 2, meaning a complete rebuilding of the fortress at a particular moment, this might just be the cumulative effect of maintenance throughout the fortress. And if you think about it, there is a logic to it that you're the commander of the legion and you've got to get that legionary fortress built quickly. So you construct it in a way that's quick and uses the very large unskilled manpower force at your disposal. Post in trench walls are the way to go. The soldiers dig the trenches. You have obtained a huge supply of roughly three inch diameter round posts to put in the walls, presumably from coppice woodlands. And you've got clay from the seven estuary or seven bank. Um, to make the walls. All of that involves no special skills, but it has built in obsolescence. How long will the, will the partition posts last before they rot at ground level? Without tantalized timber from B&Q, 10 years, maybe less, possibly even with tantalized timber. But the legionary carpenters and masons could work their way around the whole fortress, replacing the post in trench walls with longer lived ones on ground sills or with masonry walls. After many years of doing that, it could look to an archeologist and looked to this one in 1988, as if the whole fortress had been rebuilt. And incidentally, in this one, um, we have the, uh, the second period, there's a sill beam in so the post in trench walls and here is a masonry wall at the back of the barracks. And we can put the chaps uh, back in there. Obviously this view of progressive maintenance should ideally, supported, should ideally be supported by detailed dates from all parts of the fortress. The 10 first century coins found at this Woolworths basement site, 10 Eastgate Street, come out as one Claudian copy, AD 48 to 64, three Nero, 64 to 68, four Vespasian, 69 to 79, two of Domitian, whose principate was 81 to 96. Nine of those coins, including the two Domitianic ones, were stratified in fortress contexts. Adding a couple of Domitianic coins from Market Street 
it seems clear that the fortress goes on until the late 80s. But as a maintained, rather than a newly built fortress, that should not be a problem for the historians. We see a military authority hanging on to what it has got, probably beyond the time it had strategic value. That is not unusual. <laughs> So finally, the colonists. What happens next looks like a dip in which the outline of the former barracks was still present, but it looks as if some of their area had become open ground. And that's picked up in the small top left drawing here of building 114 at Barclay Street. This is a particularly pleasing bit of evidence because there is this little modest um, building which has three rooms with mortar floors or three basic rooms with mortar floors and a graveled yard and it's set within the dotted outlines of the limits of former barrack buildings so it's set within that space and obligingly it's got a tiled hearth and one of the tiles has an RPG stamp on it so this shows us that this is a colonial period building um, in which RPG Res Publica Glevencium Corporation of Gloucester is in action. Some decades later, the situation has changed quite radically and as shown by Building 118, and many of you I think will probably know this from Phil Moss's lovely reconstruction in the book that he and Andy did, um, based on this excavation, this evidence from the site. And I might say that these two buildings are exactly in the same area. So if you look at that diagonal wall in the little 114, there it still is as part of um, the big courtyard house. So we can say that by, let's say, 150 uh, AD, or possibly a couple of decades before that, um, Gloucester Centre has now become a pretty densely built up site where the imprint of the old legionary barracks has partly disappeared and you're getting the comfort that you would expect of a reasonably high quality Roman town. Now we can make a comparison with Eastgate Street, which we'll do in the next slide, but just before that, let's take a step back and reflect on this origin of Colonia. It's actually not surprising for it to have started with a drop in built up space if we think about the supply of colonists. If, as I think they were, they were mainly military veterans, there just wouldn't have been that many of them. The three legions in late first century Britain would be about 15 and a half thousand men, 15.6, and one can guess at a similar number of auxiliaries, so making an army of about 31,000. Taking an average term of service of 25 years, that would yield a bit more than a thousand veterans, a thousand retiring soldiers per year, if they all survived to retirement age, which of course they wouldn't have. Any exact figures are therefore a bit fictitious, but not the general order of magnitude. So let's just imagine that we have less than a thousand veterans a year, let's say 600 veterans a year, are hitting the market in Roman Britain. They had three British colonii to settle in if they didn't want to go elsewhere. So perhaps 150 to 200 made their way to Gleevem each year. So that makes a small start, but you can see that over two or three decades, that would grow quite considerably. Now at Eastgate Street, um, we can't do the fine tuning as in that Barclay Street example, but we can have a pretty good idea of how things were two or three decades into the colonia, and that's the plan on the left-hand side. Um, so if we go through this plan, at the very top of the plan, by the Via Principalis, which is effectively Eastgate Street, the evidence here was very limited, but there is, I think, just enough to suggest there was a portico beside the street with things that look like shops and workshops in a band behind that. And this reproduces what was there in the legionary fortress when there were store buildings behind uh, a portico, so-called tabernae. Then you get 
three buildings or three blocks of building, the, the um, first two of these entirely block out one of the roads or graveled areas between the barracks of the legionary fortress. That disappears altogether. And you have building 516, which I don't know that we know a great deal about other than that it was there. Building 517 is a big barn-like building, you can see there, which has walls almost a metre wide. <coughs> Inside it, there are traces of ovens and no really decent surfaces. So I'm wondering if this wasn't, um, I mean, it's some sort of store building and a reasonable guess, it's purely a guess to make at it, is that this might have been uh, a grain store come milling area, come bakery. And um, what we've mainly got evidence for is the evidence of ovens on the floor. And then there is this little building, 518. I don't know if it only consisted of three rooms, but without going into quite complicated, complicated arguments, I think that's a plausible guess. And one of those three rooms is this mosaic on the right-hand side. Um, quite a nice detail in that, <clears throat> as understood, the mosaic it has a central panel, which alas is missing, but here you can't really see it, but uh, believe me, this is like a human mask in the form of a human face, but it's looking at the back wall of the building. It's looking at the back there. On the other hand, if you go around the edges of the panel, you've got um, 60 centimetre wide strips here of just plain, well, I mean, presumed on this side, demonstrated on that side, on that side, of just plain mosaic. So if this was a sort of triclinium or dining room with three couches round the three sides, that would work quite nicely uh, because you would look from the back at the human face on the, on the mask there in front of you and see the central panel. Also, so that's um, Eastgate Street. And this is, of course, part of the story that goes on. It shows us, it confirms the picture of um, the Colonia as a comfortable Roman town with high comfort levels. And in this block at the bottom of the plan here, marked further buildings, no less than 15 mosaics were recorded, unfortunately, um, all in salvage conditions, but they underline the prosperity and they show it stretching into the fourth century. But that would be another story. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, that was brilliant. Really interesting. I look forward to the discussion when that comes up.